Hello everyone, bringing you a video today talking about this. Um, this is first issue, uh, British 1958 pattern web equipment. Uh, this being the web equipment which would serve the British Army through the majority of the Cold War, um, with PLC sort of making an appearance at the end, and this taking over from 1937 pattern in the very late 1950s. Um, so uh, but the transitional period, 1937 pattern, would be around for a long time uh, with uh, second line units and so forth. Uh, after the introduction of 1958 pattern, but that's obviously when it was first introduced and it was first issued out to frontline units, uh, primarily the British Army of the Rhine. Uh, those troops in Europe were some of the first to get it uh, as the most up-to-date uh, set of equipment available at the time. The combination here with battle dress is perhaps a slightly unusual one, one you don't see very often. It's more normal to associate 1958 pattern with combat uniform, which of course was uh, being introduced at a similar time. But the 1960s uh, is a very interesting period and there was a real transition between battle dress and combat uniform and 1958 pattern and uh, 1937 pattern. So the new uniform and new equipment coming in uh, and you get crossovers like this. We have the 1949 pattern battle dress uh, with 1958 pattern web equipment. Uh, now the photographs I've sort of based this on, well, I suppose I'm, I'm just using a period uniform to set off the equipment because what we're talking about is the 1958 pattern equipment. But there are photographs of uh, men wearing parts of 1958 pattern in battle dress. Uh, it certainly uh, does uh, crop up. Whether they would wear it in full um, marching order is a, a different matter or whether they'd even wear full uh, combat order is a different matter um, because obviously it tended to be used as more of a number two uniform by this point as opposed to combat uniform in the field. Uh, but the combination did certainly show up. It does show up in photographs to a degree. Uh, very briefly about the uniform before we get on to talk about the equipment, and this will be brief because I'm doing a separate video looking at this battle dress uniform, uh, which will be coming out soon. But to just run over the details very briefly, uh, this is very indicative of the time period, 1962 specifically, and we have a battle dress badged to the uh, Cheshire's, Cheshire Regiment, um, in 6th Infantry Brigade, which you'll see the insignia of when we move the mannequin round, you'll see the Cheshire shoulder title and the blue uh, 6th Infantry Brigade badge underneath that. However, um, we interestingly also have collar badges on uh, the battle dress, which was again something which would crop up at, at this time period uh, in the 1960s, you see, um, or very late 1950s, 1960s, you see collar badges begin to be worn on battle dress as well. Um, the cap badge is for the Mersham Brigade. Now, obviously, there are two brigades I've mentioned there, 6th Infantry Brigade and the Mersham Brigade. The Mersham Brigade was the administrative brigade uh, which the Cheshire Regiment had become part of. So by this time period, the British Army had been reorganised and for administra administration purposes, the regiments were cap badged to an a administrative brigade, the Mershams being one and then you'd wear your regimental shoulder titles to show your regimental affiliation, uh, but you were part of the brigade and the brigade wore a common cap badge. Uh, and then obviously from that brigade, you would be deployed out to active service brigades, not just administri administrative brigades, you'd be out to an infantry brigade or whatever um, you, unit you were deployed to and you'd wear that badge, or your formation badge on your arm. So there's an interesting combination of insignia there. Otherwise, it's a standard 1949 pattern battle dress with the wool shirt and tie, as we can see there. But onto the equipment itself, as I've said, 1962, so we have early issue components of 1958 pattern, essentially initial issue here to look at. We'll start looking at the pouches, which you can see around the front here. We'll look at a bit more detail of these as we move them around. These are designed to take both the magazine for the self-loading rifle, the L1A1, which of course was in service, very much in service by this point, and also they will take the 30 round magazine for the L4, which is the 762 version of the Bren, essentially the light machine gun. So they are designed to take those with the indicative features of early issue 1958 pattern. They're relatively shallow. Um, they're not as deep as the third issue, which we'll have a look at in future videos. And you have this very um, significant stiffening to the side of the lid here and this curve to it. Uh, quite over-engineered in that regard, and this would soon disappear. We'll be looking at these in more detail in a part two of this. Um, we'll look at the internal details and so forth there. But you can see, obviously, we have the quick release tab and everything, which will become synonymous with 1958 pattern, which have been introduced on previous sets of equipment, but a bit beefier version here, a bit easier to use than the, the earlier type you'd see on 1937 pattern and 1944 pattern. So that's an improvement there. The belt itself, this is not actually a first issue belt. The only difference between the first issue and those that would come later is a slight change to the length of the respective sizes of the belt. This is a, a later issue type. Visually, looking at it now, you can't tell the difference. 
literally it's just slightly shorter in terms of, of the amount of belt there is there to adjust the, than the earlier issue. So that is one slight concession here. I don't have an early issue 9058 pattern belt, which are, as I say, are slightly longer if you compare them against each other. But otherwise it is uh, of standard 9058 pattern design. The design didn't change other than the length which means we have uh, adjustment down the center here with a hook and eyelet similar to US practice, but we still have the Mills hook and loop buckle here. Let's see, uh, a tried and true design and the sliders to keep the belt together where it doubles back on itself for adjustment. We'll take a look at some more of the details of this as we move the mannequin around. We have here the yoke, uh, which supports the, the pouches and this is a, a break away from previous British designs. The 1944 pattern had had braces which were sewn together at the rear, so the straps were crossed and were sewn together. This is one solid piece over the shoulders in an H pattern with straps coming down. So it's, much as people sometimes look at the 1944 pattern and say it's a yoke, it isn't. This is a yoke uh, with that solid padded area over the shoulders. And this was a, a good step forward in terms of design. It spreads the load quite nicely of the, the belt equipment we have here. The way the pack attaches is terrible, but the way it supports the, the equipment worn on the belt is actually pretty good for the time period. Um, so as worn in battle order, which is what we're looking at here primarily, um, that, is, uh, that is actually quite a good part of the design. The way you can tell this from later um, um, issues of the, uh, the yoke, we don't have straps here, and we'll see when the pack is worn, the strap for the pack just comes over the strap on the yoke, the shoulder pad on the yoke, uh, and later they would introduce a small strap which that would pass under to stop it sliding, stop those straps sliding off the weight bearing part of the yoke here. But that's what we can see at the front of the equipment here. We'll move this round now and we'll have a look at the left. On the left hand side of the equipment here you can see uh, we have the, this basically set up in, in battle order or fighting order I think it was at this point. Uh, the ammunition pouch here you have loops on the side perpetuating from the 1944 pattern the ability to carry the bayonet on the side of the pouch there which is, is a good idea really, it keeps it up and out of the way, it's not swinging around in its own separate frog, it's held tight to the side of the pouch there. You can also see uh, the little ring at the bottom here, which allows the strap on this here, the cape carrier, to come around and hook on there to stop that bouncing. Uh, it also pulls the pouches back a little bit. These early 1958 pattern pouches sit vertically down on the belt, the hooks are not angled as they would be with the third issue, which means that they can interfere because they hang very low, they can interfere with the legs. When you're not wearing this, they do hang literally straight down. So this feature here is actually quite helpful in pulling them back out of the way uh, and giving you that freedom of movement by having them pulled out of the way of the, the front of the thighs. You can also see the side profile of the uh, rear pouches here, colloquially known as kidney pouches. These being first issue, we have a stiffening piece in the side of the lid there, as you can see. There's no upper support, so they just have the, the belt loops and keys and a quick release tab to attach them to the belt. As I say, we'll have a look at all of these features in more detail in part two, just describing them to you here and showing on the mannequin to give you an idea of how everything goes together. As I say, at the top later on, you'd have a support piece that would attach them to the yoke so that they wouldn't sag away, but you can see here that they are free to sag away. Um, but that's the main feature here of the first issue. The second issue were very similar to this, but deleted this stiffening piece you can see in the side of the lid there. Um, the cape carrier itself and those we'll have a look at in a bit more detail. We'll move this round now and have a look at the back of the equipment. Looking at the back of the equipment here, we can better see the uh, rear pouches uh, and these basically allow you to carry a good portion of what you would originally have carried in the 1937 pattern haversack. So you can put a mess tin half in each, you can fit the contents of your hold all in there, uh, wash kit and so forth. So they're quite useful from that point of view and they carry the weight low down on the belt, uh, on, throw a good bit of the weight onto the hips. Um, in that sense, 1958 pattern is quite a good step forward and it's quite a good design when worn in this configuration. We will have a look at this with the pack attached uh, a little bit later on and that really is a poor part of the design. You can also see coming down here down the middle, and the reason for having the two separate pouches could be seen here, you've got the lightweight shovel uh, which is part of this equipment set. You can see that attaches using a, 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 a fitting on the back of the yoke here uh, which there's a hole in the handle, we'll see the detail of that um, when we look at this in more detail in part two. Basically, it, it, the, hole, the spigot goes into the hole in the handle and then you just clip the uh, quick release tab tight around that and that holds it in place. In addition, on the cape carrier, we have a strap here which loops over it to stop it bouncing around. Uh, and that's quite an effective way of carrying it. This is done according to the manual with the head of the shovel facing outwards, 
although it's not uncommon to actually see it with the shovel facing head facing inwards the hole goes all the way through the handle so you can wear or you can carry this one way around or the other it's common to see it done the other way in photographs this is just taken directly from the fitting instructions you can also see the padded section of the yoke across the back here and you can see it is stitched together as one contiguous piece with straps coming off it these come down and support the belt and they hook on using c hooks which is a, a detail of the yoke we'll see when we look at this in more detail going on to the cape carrier itself this is described as a cape carrier, so what I have in it here is the green version of the Mark 7 ground sheet cape, or Mark 7 ground sheet. Um, it certainly was used to carry the 1962 pattern poncho and then later the lightweight poncho, but it's not initially described as a poncho carrier. So what it was initially intended to carry is not entirely clear whether it was intended to carry the poncho introduced with the late war jungle equipment on the more general issue. Not entirely clear. What I've put in here for the moment is the, the cape uh, the ground sheet cape because it is called a cape carrier so that's an assumption on my part just to pad it out basically so you can see obviously we've got straps on both sides which hook forward onto the ammunition pouches uh, it hooks onto the belt the belt has two little d-rings and clips that clip onto the bottom of the belt there and it's held together with two sets of quick release tabs and loops down the bottom uh, there is also capacity here across the front to carry the head for the lightweight pick, which was also associated with this equipment, you could carry the shovel, the lightweight shovel, or the lightweight pick. Um, and the, the held the pick would run down there in place of the shovel with the head carried separately in this section of the webbing here. So the cape carrier serves a dual purpose in that regard. One thing you can't see, which we'll mention briefly when we look at this in more detail, is you do have two little utility straps which are carried when not in use, are carried in the flap of the uh, rear pouches there. We'll move this around now and we will have a look at the right hand side of the equipment. Looking at the right hand side of the equipment here, there's not a huge amount more to see than there was on the left. One thing that's conspicuous by its absen absence is a water bottle of any description. And this is a, a failing of the early issue of 1958 pattern. It wasn't until around 1962 when many of the second issue components were coming out that a water bottle, the plastic water bottle we're all familiar with today, was finally issued. So it wasn't uncommon at this time period to see the 1944 pattern water bottle carried with 1958 pattern in its carrier, but I've omitted it here because it isn't actually part of the equipment. I'd say this is something that's been discussed in previous videos. It was a failing and they, hadn't, they didn't seem to have made a decision on exactly how and where the water bottle was going to be carried in the 1958 pattern equipment before it was issued. There was talk of the uh, old enamel water bottle being carried in one of the kidney pouches, and indeed a square plastic bottle was also made that fitted neatly inside one of the kidney pouches, but you lose a large amount of your sort of subsistence load carrying capacity when you do that. Obviously you lose an entire kidney pouch, an entire rear pouch, you lose that volume, and it's very inaccessible around the rear to try and unhook and get your hand in to to actually pull the bottle out, having it round on the hip is a lot more convenient. Um, even then when introduced, the pouch for the bottle wasn't great, but we'll have a look at that when I do a video looking at the second issue components together on the mannequin. Uh, one thing I would stress, uh, much as we're looking at first issue components here, uh, they don't just disappear out of service. Indeed, there are photos from the 1980s of ammunition, older first issue 1958 pattern ammunition pouches being used by second line troops primarily. I think the photo I'm thinking of is Royal Corps of Transport, the chap with the sterling, he just had the flap open with his magazines jammed in it. Um, he has one ammunition pouch, if I remember correctly, on the belt, and it's just been used to carry sterling uh, magazines. The frontline troops would tend to get the more up-to-date pouches because they had greater capacity, but you'd still see older yokes and things in use well into the 80s. This isn't definitive. The way I'll be running through it chronologically, obviously, bits will be mixed, mixed and matched because the equipment is just in stock and it's going to be issued out as and when it's needed. Speaking of the ammunition pouch, we have on the right here, uh, the right hand ammunition pouch has a little pouch on the side itself with a twist lock, which will I'll show you that in more detail. We look at the uh, everything in more detail. This is for the adapter for the um, it's, uh, rifle grenades, essentially the Energa system. Uh, and that unfortunately obviously was introduced as part of the equipment set, this little feature. The Energa rifle grenade adapter fell out of use quite soon after 1958 pattern had been introduced. Uh, but it would remain a part of the design right through until the very last issue of ammunition pouches which were introduced for the system. So uh, a little bit of a, a, a vestigial part of the equipment there, you could say um, one that fell out of use very quickly um, but remained as part of the manufacturing of the design right the way through almost to the end of production. Um, so a little point of interest there but not really of much use, otherwise the pouch is very similar uh, to the one on the other side but obviously a mirror image with the loop 
to attach onto the cape carrier on the other side uh, so that it can hook round onto the, the strap coming round on the right hip there. Um, but that is the, uh, the right hand side of the equipment set. You can see the pack. Now this is obviously, this is something that would remain relatively consistent throughout the production of 1958 pattern. The major change being uh, the removal of the uh, crimp tips in favour of the more traditional British riveted type. Uh, these were found to pull off rather easily. And the side pockets here have little stiffening pieces in the side of the lids in common with the pouches. These would be removed as well, an incremental change. Um, the pack is probably the most maligned part of the equipment set and with good reason. Uh, it's a very poor design, the way it's carried, the way the weight is distributed onto the equipment, uh, which we'll have a look at in just a second, is really poor compared to previous British equipment sets. Um, certainly uh, design ethos, uh, design thinking seems a bit muddled with this, especially when you consider there were better um, solutions to this problem that have been used on previous much earlier sets of equipment. You have straps at the top here, which we'll, we'll have a look at all the straps and fittings and everything in more detail when we look at part two of this, but just to run over them briefly, straps at the top here, which means you can carry a rolled load, such as a parka, perhaps the sleeping bag on the top of the pack there. You do have uh, cross straps, which you can just see underneath here. We'll have a look at the helmet supported by these shortly, which is the purpose for them. We'll see you no longer have the supporting straps of the 1908 pack, which have been used as well with 1937 pattern. They could be used to carry the helmet on the back of the pack. As they're not part of this design, you just have these separate straps uh, which just serve the purpose of being able to carry a load strapped to the back of the pack. Duplication of what we saw on the yoke, which is the fitting to allow you to carry the entrenching tool, the shovel, the lightweight shovel, or the uh, helve from the pick. Uh, and that obviously then passes down and straps through, as we saw before, onto the uh, cape carrier down below. Uh, you can see somewhat with the kidney pouches, a bit of support is provided, and this would be improved obviously with the improvement to the kidney pouches, which would be brought in later on, where they were supported against the yoke with the upper set of uh, quick release uh, tabs and, and loops. Uh, but in this instance, that's not there. So they, they offer limited support really. As we'll look at now, the vast majority of the weight is thrown directly onto the shoulders. Hopefully, hopefully you can see clearly here the method by which the pack is attached. You have a strap that runs over the shoulder uh, padding, the padded area of the shoulder of the yoke and simply hooks onto these D-rings at the front uh, using a simple aluminium hook. You then also have a strap which runs forward from the base of the pack, which clips into the, the little ring at the top of the ammunition pouches there, uh, and that stops it obviously bouncing around. But that is the only method of support for the entire weight. This is quite a large bulky piece of webbing to have swinging around only supported by these two methods. Uh, but that said, later on in 1958's pattern service life, this would become much maligned because it doesn't carry enough. Private purchase Bergens were not only introduced to basically make it easier to carry heavy loads and more comfortable compared to this system, but also to be able to carry more as well because the pack really doesn't carry a great deal uh, by that point. The modern soldier was being expected, was expected to carry a much greater load than this really made uh, room for. Uh, so it's in terms of that, one of the reasons the pack would, would be um, an unpopular bit of kit, certainly later on, and I don't think it was ever popular. It's not a good design. Uh, but it would remain in service, interestingly enough. There is an idea that it falls out of use and you just see it worn essentially in uh, combat order uh, with just the kidney pouches. Not so uh, the Falklands. There are certainly many troops who didn't have access to or hadn't purchased their own uh, rucksacks and bergens who ended up having to use these. Um, a friend of mine who was in Harry's support force, Royal Engineers, mentions the pack uh, and how poor it was. And it certainly was by that point. The really was a, a very outdated bit of kit and a poorly designed one in the first instance anyway. But this is the uh, the initial issue pack. We'll just have a look now at it uh, with the helmet attached as well as the shovel. By way of completeness, you can see here the pack fully loaded with the helmet on top of the shovel. See, we could still carry a load on top of here. But even as is, it's quite a bulky and unwieldy load to carry using the method that's provided with the 1958 pattern, which is basically just the hooks and the straps coming around to meet the uh, ammunition pouches. So yeah, that's just to show you the use of the rear cross straps on the pack essentially in order to carry the helmet like that. So there we are, that's a look through at the initial issue of 1958 pattern, uh, these initial issue components. Um, as I say, there are trial items which differ slightly from this going back further, but this is the initial set uh, as issued essentially um, with the all the components in their first iterations. Uh, but we'll be doing separate videos looking at the second issue and so forth going forward. Uh, as already said, that's not entirely chronological. Older pieces would still be issued out later on, of course, 
but it just it's for illustrative purposes primarily. If you found this video interesting and you think you'd find future videos interesting, then please, of course, do consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, and whether you're newly subscribing or you've already subscribed, please do make sure you hit the notification button down below. That will alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you'd like to support the channel, you can do. There's a Patreon and a PayPal link down below. Uh, and obviously, thank you very much to everyone who supports me through, the, through those two methods. It really is greatly appreciated. Um, there's also a Facebook and Instagram page and now Twitter as well. Should you wish to follow the channel on social media, uh, you can do using those. And it, should you wish to get in contact with me but you don't have social media, there is of course the email address down below as well where you can send photographs, ask questions and things like that and I try and get back to you. Uh, but that's everything for this video, so until next time, bye for now.